Hello. Oh, wonderful. Yeah, thanks a lot that you're interested in what we did the last three days. I'm Eric. I was one of the organizers of the Startup Weekend Airport that took place from um, Tuesday, no, from Wednesday till Friday. And I'd like to introduce you, oh, yeah, I'd like to introduce the teams of the Startup Weekend Airport and the winner of the Startup Weekend Berlin 2012. And they will pitch in front of you. But before we start, I'd like to to explain the setting for you, that you know what is important and what is not. Like, definitely really important, the person who stands here. They will pitch their, their ideas. Also very important, we have a clock over here, because every, um, every pitch has a time limit of three minutes, and there is a sign, a blinking sign, called a blouse. And if you know what it means, then you should follow it and Make a warm applause to the, the pitch that then hopefully finished. Um, the judges are over here. And yeah, first of all, I'd like to say that we had pla the plan that the winner of Startup Weekend Berlin 2011 will also present their idea. Maybe you heard about Clash, clashapp.com. Unfortunately, they can't be here today, but if you're interested in what it is, Go on the website, Clash with a K at the beginning, clashapp.com. Really funny, they made an amazing pitch um, at this Startups Daily, Berlin versus London. You can see it on, uh, on YouTube, amazing. But now we come to our first pitch. It's Yuma with his project Morelli, and he was one of the winners of Startup Weekend Berlin 2012. Like a warm welcome for Yuma. Thank you, Eric. Yeah, hello, hello to everybody. We are glad to be here and present you more really the so online social impact game. Well, it all began about a year ago when I designed and developed uh, an educational board game, as you can see also here. And in the game, players are CEOs of companies who have to invest in sustainability projects. And the ultimate goal is to become the most sustainable player, CEO, and company in the game. But we also want to make the game an online version. Um, as you can nowadays play, for instance, Monopoly or Settlers of Catan online. And this is the mock-up of our online version. And the players have to invest in sustainability projects, as you can see on these action cards. And on these action cards, real companies can advertise their real sustainability projects. For instance, HIV program of Coca-Cola or the hybrid car of Toyota. And by clicking on one of these pictures, a link may open with further information about this specific sustainability project. So, Ted Smith is our target player, and he just achieved 100 victory points in the online game. And as a reward, he's directed to a charity platform and can pick his favorite charity project. And Coca-Cola, as a corporate sponsor, may pay his donation in form of 100 cents. So, how do we get enough players? This is, of course, crucial, and the answer is viral marketing. So, since Ted Smith is very, very proud that he generated this donation, he can, with one click, post on his Facebook wall um, a, share, a post that says that he made Coca-Cola donate to the charity project just by playing Morelli. And this post can not only attract further players very easily to the game, but also gives a lot of publicity to the companies for relatively little investments. There are two target groups globally. For the players, um, we target at people who have a lifestyle of health and sustainability and gaming geeks. And for the companies, we go for very big companies among the Fortune 500. The main revenue streams are the in-game advertising on the project cards, as you've seen. Then the corporate sponsors pay for every Facebook share additionally. A few players also would like to play the board game offline with their friends so they can order the um, board game online. And 
um, in the midterm, we also want to actually develop a platform and embed further games from external educational game developers and allow them to copy our business model and give them the opportunity to use our technological interface to make the donation aspect happen. Yeah, thank you a lot for your attention and yeah, feel free to ask any questions. I haven't quite understood. Is it um, is it a, a non-profit um, idea or a business, or is it a for-profit? I I would say I, it's for. Pro I mean, uh, legally, uh, it's planned for profit, but of course, it has a social mission. It's an educational game, and there are a lot of donations happening. But in the end, we are also for profit. Is that confusing? Not really. I think we also have to earn money and survive. So that's why. We think it's not a contradiction. Germany is often considered a contradiction to be for profit and also do social, to have a social mission. But we think both are actually quite fine. Well, I guess then you don't have an exit strategy for this business. It's rather that you want to maintain your own um, structure and do good on the um, as, as your main primary objective. Yeah, yeah, actually, yeah. Okay. Well, I, th I think it's well presented. It's, it's a good product. I think from what I've heard, um, I wish you best. And I think it's not VC um, uh, compatible, as you've already understood with the question that you asked before. So, but but uh, I think it's, um, well, definitely a good product. Yeah. And I like your definition of, of social entrepreneurship. Like, it's still about profits, but the profits can be lower if the company is doing something good, if I can interpret it that way. <laughs> um, yeah, I think so as well. It's probably no VC case, but I think as you probably need very little money to get it going, simply try if users like it or not and yeah, all the best for it. Actually, we are planning to do a crowdfunding campaign because especially for gaming and also for social entrepreneurs, this was proven to be very suitable. Very good idea. And the, the thing that it's a board game is very handy because one can make risk-free experiments and just develop a board game, make a cheap prototype and see whether it's fun. And only make the online game if the board game is fun. So this is what we did and that's why it's, it's a cheap entrepreneurial design, one could say. Yeah, thanks. Thank you a lot for your attention. Thanks, Morley. Okay, then give a warm welcome to our next project. It's Air Air Marker. Air Marker. I'm sorry. <laughs> I knew it for the last 24 hours, and now I've forgotten it. But warm welcome for Air Marker. Participant of Startup Weekend Airport. Okay. Like these are your three minutes. Go. Okay. Hi. Uh, my name is Miho Tanaka, and the, and I'm going to talk to you a little bit about Airmarker. Um, the Airmarker team consists of. Oh, sorry. It's I'm responsive. Um, the Airmarker team consists of myself. Uh, my background is in uh, digital concept strategy, um, usability, AR, um, and I've worked with clients such as Mini, BMW, and Bayer. Um, my CTO is Sebastian. Um, he's the lead developer, and he currently works as a, um, a, 
a research assistant at uh, Software Engineering, um, which is a, a research firm, um, sorry, research institute uh, specializing in developing AR and mobile. Um, and he also works for Samsung on the side because he's so brilliant. Um, and our uh, UX designer is Julian Rapp. Um, so what is AirMarker? Uh, basically, um, AirMarker is um, a mobile app that lets you um, draw scribbles in the air and take snaps of it. And so how it works is that um, you draw something and then uh, the accelerometer and the gyroscope um, tracks your motion. And then so when you step back and you look at it, you get to see it and snap it. So say I do this, and then when I step back, I'll see something like that on my mobile phone, and I can snap it in, in real space. Um, and we'll have a brush and color options, so you can draw a fire or draw with smoke. Um, and we'll, people can upload their own brushes also. Um, and there are two parts of AirMarker. Uh, there's the free version, where, where it's just a fun photo app, um, and it's got limited features. And we've got AirMarker Pro, which lets you create scribbles in 3D space and have them sort of pinpointed locationally. Um, and it's got unlimited features, which I'll talk a little more about later. So the AirMarker customer is an iPhone user uh, between the ages of uh, early teens to early 30s. They love taking photos. They love Instagram. They love apps like Mr. Chizu and Stick2, which let you make your pictures look cool. Um, our AirMarker Pro uh, customer is someone who needs to do real space uh, problem solving like, c creatively, like uh, landscape designers and interior uh, designers um, who do yeah, real space problem solving. Uh, so our business model is the free to use um, model is, is the fun photo app where you, uh, you scribble, snap and share, um, but it all goes it's all public, so it all gets uploaded to public, and those are your limited features. Uh, the subscription model uh, lets you store and ex uh, export scribbles as 3D, so if you want it as CAD files, um, and if you're working with a client, say, oh, sorry, yeah. Thank you. Bye. Did you already develop um, all of that, or no, is it a prototype? It's, or? Uh, we're still working on the prototype, yeah. But there are, um, if you look at apps such as um, uh, Tourist, which is the app that won Demogods this year, um, uh, you can easily see that there are, there are things out, it, it's, it's possible, because what Tourist does is um, it, it it lets you do like a 360 sort of tour of say you're in the Coliseum and you can see the floor and you can see it round and round in 360 and up in the ceiling. So if I can see this, then it's tracking my motion and that motion can be visualized, basically. Um, and also there's already an app called um, Air, I think, oh, Light Brush or something like that. Um, um, and basically it, it just, when you do that, it draws that on your screen, but that's not AR and it's not in 3D space. So um, our concept is going to sort of marry the two technologies that are used in those apps so that you can use it um, if you're a professional um, uh, and you're landscaping, you can say, I want a sculpture here and I want a lake by it. And then you can see how it looks like from the driveway, you can see how it'll look from the balcony or if you are um, designing a storefront for Louis Vuitton, you can sort of very quickly sort of sketch out your design in 3D. Any ideas how to make this, this sticky, so to say, so that, that, that people don't switch to another app, which, which maybe has the same functionalities, so kind of social features you can introduce to that, or what, what, yes. what's the idea about that? Um, so, of, of course, um, it'll be shareable um, uh, for Facebook and Twitter, um, and you can upload these images to Instagram because people love putting photos on everything. Um, and also, we'll have, um, because we'll be inviting people to upload their own um, brushes, we'll have new brushes being featured 
each week so that people can come back and go, oh, I want to try that new brush and so forth. Um, and also our pro model is, well, when it's a useful tool for people, then it's something that you, you, you want to use over and over. Um, yeah. I think it's definitely a fun uh, product. It, it looks like a lot of fun. I, I will try it out myself uh, yeah. as soon as I can. Um, <laughs> I think it would be important, of course, the time is not enough to go into depth on that, but I think it's important to understand the other applications of this sort of technology um, beyond a, a fun consumer uh, yeah. thing. Um, yeah. But I think, of course, it's not the time right now. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So our, um, our pro app for the landscape designers and interior designers intend to use what we learn from the free app so that um, we, can, we can offer a, a, um, a quality and reliable um, tool for, for those people. Yeah. Thank you. A big applause to Air Marker. Okay, then I'd like to say hello to the next team. It's Team Beatmatic. And they will need some preparing time, I think. Is it working now? Okay, everything's there, cool. Then, yeah, I'd say hello to you. And we'll give you 10 more seconds to get, oh, it's done? Perfect, all right. You're three minutes from now. Hi, um, uh, I'm Martin Percosi from Beatmatic. Um, and this is Thomas. And just to give you a little bit of background about myself, um, I studied uh, mathematics and computer science at Imperial College, worked at uh, Goldman Sachs for, for three years, and then was a, a co-founder at a statistical arbitrage hedge fund. Um, Hi, I'm Thomas. I worked for the last few years in a big corporate and was managing uh, subsidiaries in terms of IT from a, with a um, turnover from 100 million to a couple of billion. Okay, and we're here to talk to you about Beatmatic. Um, so, basically, our, our main point, our vision is that everybody loves music, and everybody, well, not everybody, but a very large segment of the population, in theory, could make music, but the problem is that the current tools to make music either don't give you enough flexibility or are arcane and very hard to use. Um, so just to give you a little bit of an example of that, my girlfriend, um, she basically has a little bit of innate ability to make some songs, um, enough to, to be able to write a song, but she can't use Cubase. It's just way too complicated. So one time what we did, about a year ago, she said, you know what, Martin, you operate Cubase, and I'll just hum to you what I want, want to be played. And she did exactly that, and we made a song, and it was gratifying you know, to see her write a song, but the problem was it was a little bit annoying for me to do it. And I, I, I thought at that moment, there must be a better way of doing this. There must be a way that the software can have a dialogue with the user. So the solution is, yeah, basically that, that the user hums a beat or hums a melody into the computer and an artificial intelligence takes care of transforming that into something that can be used with any sound, to put any effect on, to change the tempo, etc. So the, our first postulate is this. Um, if you take the distribution of musical ability, then it effectively looks like a bell curve in a similar way to sort of people's heights. Um, and if you look at the way top, uh, if you weigh, look at the way top of the, of, the, of the bell curve, you have pros. Um, and if you look at the center of the bell curve, you've basically got people at a level that can sing happy birthday. Now the current music software market caters only to basically the pros because it's very difficult to use. And what we're saying is we can make, shift it a little bit further down the bell curve and get a much bigger market. If you take 8% of population play an instrument, that's about 25 million Americans. Um, if you increase that to 20%, well then you're looking at 50 million Americans that could potentially use this software. All right, so now demo time, um, and just a few caveats with the demo. We wrote this demo in 54 hours. There's some artificial intelligence behind it, and this is a very noisy room, so it's very possible that things don't work out. Um, just a second, let's just show really quickly what the, well, whatever, let's just do it. All right, so now basically what I'm gonna do Okay, didn't quite, 
yeah, sorry, like the conditions are just not ideal for this to work right now. Um, yeah, that's what it looks like. Into the beat. Yeah, and what we, the next step is obviously to do it with bass lines and then harmony instruments. Okay, thank you. It's a cool idea, but um, how, how do you want to, want to make money with this? Okay, so basically, um, I have to say there, we haven't completely worked that out yet, but we've got three basic avenues. The first is basically give away an app for free and sell expansion packs. So basically, you know, you can get different sounds, 808 kick sounds, techno packs, house packs, indie packs, and so on. Um, the second thing is that I think the technology is qu quite new and could be licensed to, for example, game vendors like Rockstar, um, yeah, basically um, license for use as well for, for, for more pro packages. There's a, there's a package available that does pitch correction called Dirac. That sells for about 10,000 euros. You could do something similar with this. And the third thing that you could do is, um, is license it, for example, if you move more to like Asian markets that are for, for which karaoke is quite popular, you could you know, do a variant on karaoke where the people can come up with their own music. I think it's an, a brilliant idea. I would love to see this actually work. And uh, unfortunately, you, you're not ready. You're not there yet. But um, please keep us updated on on, on your progress. It uh, looks amazing. We we've actually invested in Ableton, um, so we come from. Uh, we have some knowledge in the in the pro side of, of things. Right. And I think that would be a, a good extension really to to address the consumer market and the, the non pros, the amateurs. So I think it's it's um, interesting, even if it's of course in an early stage right now. Yeah. yeah, I mean, like, yeah, I mean, we we need to obviously work on the robustness of the product. I mean, so far it's really been tested just on my voice, <laughs> which is clearly not enough, right? We need to work up a big corp bigger corpus of data. Um, I do think Ableton is a great company, but Ableton is is one of those examples that if someone doesn't know how to make music, they look at that Ableton screen and they're just scared because it, you know there's this big blank thing, and I think. The point of this software is essentially that it fills in the blanks for you. It gives you an easy way of filling in those blanks. Yeah, I think it's uh, it's really an amazing product. I mean, the question, of course, is how exactly you want to monetize it. But I think the bigger question will be how you can acquire enough users. For example, if you have a free product, you have to think in really big numbers to get a meaningful uh, bottom line. But um, great stuff. Yeah, I mean, like in terms of in terms of acquiring, I mean, I think what we showed there is one third of the product. First of all, we got to get this working. The second part is to make bass lines available, and the third part is make melodies available. And I think once you've got that, um, and it's quick and easy to make a drum line, then you could imagine something it possibly going viral through through basic basically Facebook sharing that you sort of say, here, I just wrote this drum line. Why don't you write a bass line to it? You know, you could imagine that being sent around the office, you know, or being sent around guys in university. Mm, yeah, I mean. In theory, in theory, yes, but in practice, even most social networks are not viral, so, no, agreed, <laughs> so yeah. I wouldn't count on it, but um, there are many different channels, so good luck. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Beatmatic. And now there is the last uh, presentation for today. It's Team Weightless. Hello, we are Team Weightless with Leah, uh, Federica, Axel, Christian, Sebastian, and me, Johannes. Oh, it's starting right now. Last Monday. It's starting now? It's starting now? Yeah? Okay. Two hours. I waited two hours at the doctor's office, and I wasn't even allowed to leave. Why is that so? On average, every German is waiting 700 minutes per year before he even sees the doctor. In just only one doctor's office, there's a total waiting time of 45 hours per day. So is it really necessary to waste so much time? We don't think so. So we developed an app for that, Wait Less, the app that will wait for you. With our app, Hannes can check in online at the doctor's office and um, which means he's um, basically 
wait, queuing up in a digital waiting line. Um, the, the app is um, pr providing information about his current waiting status and it comes along with um, different notifications like when there is a delay because of an emergency or if there is a free time slot because other patients haven't shown up or it informs Hannes when it's time to ha head back to the doctor's office. So with Waitless, um, you will never wait again like Hannes. Now let's come to the business model. There are some systems at the market you can book your appointments online, but we focus additionally at the waiting process by making the dynamic changes transparent. Our stakeholders are not just only the patients and the doctors, we also want to address the pharma industry and the local stores just around the corner. So we develop for every target group an individual pricing model. To win these groups, we will do several types of marketing activities, like point of sale marketing for the patients, sales for the doctors, and going to the huge congresses for the pharma industry. But the doctor's offices are just the beginning. We want to go further and um, go to other markets because wait less you can use for all kinds of waiting lines. And how do we want to do that? Well, we started off here at the Startup Weekend and developed our idea during the 54 hours that we had. We also tested it with 12 users and one doctor. And our next steps now is to actually make a really big business plan and a product concept as a first milestone. Then as the next milestone, have a prototype and a MVP. And finally, to release it onto the market. And all of this, we as a team want to achieve together with you, so we're looking forward to a great cooperation. So one, one thing I didn't understand, I mean, regarding the, uh, the value proposition, I think it's great, uh, but um, you want to market towards consumers as well? Did I get that right? Yeah, why not? The, the thing is, when, when you start with consumers, um, basically, they can put pressure on, on the, the doctors themselves. We can start with doctors. Usually, we would seed the product to a small target group, start with the doctor first, and then expand it, because we think if we can get the consumer on the one side, um, they will seed for us at some point. So if they have made the good experience with um, at one doctor, they will want to transport that to other, um, other doctors. But basically, from, from um, a marketing point of view, the, the more important is definitely the doctors and the pharmacy industry, because we see the pharmacy industry as some sort of multiplicator for us, because they have good contacts with doctors. And um, if we can give them a good value proposition, which is basically at space, um, even outside of the doctor's office, um, they can help us to, to feed it into the doctor market and then vice versa to the consumer market. Okay, sounds, sounds a bit confusing to me. I think it's a bit, perhaps it's a bit uh, over-engineered. For example, I think for most startups, it's more healthy to see branding as a function of sales than sales as a function of branding, but details. <laughs> I think it's a great idea, um, addressing a, a huge pain point. I mean, everybody hates waiting um, every, anywhere. Um, question is, if you say with the doctors, have you thought about how, how, how what do you need to do to integrate with the doctors? So what, what is necessary for you, so to say, to, 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 to get into the doctor's office? There, there are different ways to approach this. First of all, there are many scheduling softwares out there. So there already is a market for, for scheduling appointments, but nothing really focusing on the transparency of the waiting process. So what we could do is approach those companies and use some APIs to interface with their products. That would be the, the easier approach. Also, I think there's a huge base of doctors doing it manually, um, like writing, using pen and paper to schedule it. So it, it might be harder, it might be a higher entrance barrier to, to attract those, but it will also give them a good, well, optimization of their processes at some point, and if we look at the demographic factor, the good thing is doctors will, uh, there will coming more and more young doctors to, um, to the market, and olders, well, are leaving the market, so the, the market itself will be 
way more technology affine than, than it is right now. So the, from a def demographic side, it will work for us. Yeah, I think you definitely identified a real life problem. I and mean, if you can tackle that, then it's great, absolutely. I think my biggest worry would actually be the distribution side of things. Yeah. Um, really going to the doctors and um, really having them, uh, do, do they have to buy your product, by the way? Um, we, we have basically f different, um, different monetization models. Mm. So they, doctors would start with a volume-based model, so the entrance barrier should be low because they can start without paying anything. Mm. But um, based on the patients they have, um, we can do additional pricing models for, let's say, 10 patients, 100 patients, 200 patients. So okay. um, the entrance barrier should be low, and we do try to do that because we, I, I agree with you that sales and distribution will be the hardest part the technology part is actually the more easier side. Yeah, agreed. I, I think you will certainly need a sales team on the ground visiting the doctors. Yeah. So that's a quite rocky road ahead of you. But if you can do that, if you uh, can sell to them, then I'd be happy. Building a startup is never easy, but yeah. well, I think you're we're right. up to it. So Yeah, good luck. Thank you. Thanks. Okay, um, I'd like to welcome all the, the pre teams that present their um, ideas in front on the stage. And we have a few minutes left, so if there are any questions for, for the teams out of the audience, then you feel, f feel free to ask now. Are there any? Otherwise, we just can give like a warm, welcome, uh, wa warm applause to them again. Big up for them. I see no raising hands. Okay, then thank you for your uh, attention and wish you a nice evening. And thanks, thanks to the VCs, thanks to the teams. Uh, one last remark, we are still, I forgot to mention that we are still looking for co-founders, so if anyone is interested in joining the Morally team, just check out our website, morally.de and drop us a message. Thank you. <laughs>